Hello and welcome to the historic All Black Town program sponsored by the Tulsa City County Library and the Tulsa Library Trust. I am Alicia Latimer, coordinator of the African American Resource Center for the Tulsa City County Library System. Today's focus is on the historic Oklahoma All Black Towns. This year, you, our viewers, have helped to make history by doing two things. One, our viewers were invited to watch the PBS documentary film, Struggle and Hope by Carrie Barber. Two, six questions were posed as a study guide while the film was being viewed. In a few moments, you will meet three participants who have not only played a significant role in the making of the film, Struggle and Hope, but whom also offer a wealth of knowledge about the historic Oklahoma all black towns. These panelists will provide the answers to the study questions from the documentary. You are welcome to learn of the significant gifts the citizens of these towns have added to our Oklahoma state history. Since 1998, the Tulsa City County Library has offered the annual historic All Black Town Tour. It's usually held on the second Saturday in June, and the tour is offered to commemorate Juneteenth or June 19, 1865, the date when slaves in Galveston, Texas, began impromptu celebrations in reaction to the delayed news of freedom via the Emancipation Proclamation. On the date of the tour, two buses, each with a historian on board, will travel around Oklahoma. Beginning at 7.30 a.m. and ending by 6 p.m., the day-long tour departs from Rudisill Regional Library in Tulsa and travels to various historic Black towns. Local historians, Black town citizens, and dignitaries of the all Black towns tell guests the history of the town and their part in Oklahoma's history. The reasonably priced ticket cost, it covers breakfast, lunch, and museum fare. This year, instead of the all Black town tour, as the African American Resource Center, I will welcome historians Jimmy White, and Shirley Nero, who will discuss the town. Joining us as our special guest is Dr. Carla Slocum, PhD, an anthropologist and author of the book, Black Towns, Black Futures. Recognizing that between 1865 and 1915, there were roughly 60 Black towns settled in the United States, Oklahoma led all the other states with more than 20 in its borders. Through listening to Carlos Slocum's research and the historical knowledge of historians Jimmy White and Shirley Nero, we will learn the fascinating history of these towns during this historically unique 2020 virtual historic all Black town experience. Shirley Ann Nero, a retired educator and a Tulsa Library African American Resource Center historian on the Oklahoma All Black Town Tours for many years, is a member of the Oklahoma Historical Society Board of Directors. All Black Town Tour historian for many years, Jimmy White, is a founding member of the Board of Directors of the Oklahoma African American Educators Hall of Fame, Inc. He also is a member of the Black Heritage Committee of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Dr. Carla Slocum teaches anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is also director of the Institute of African American Research and co-founder of the Black Communities Conference, an event that connects researchers and Black community members on work that supports Black communities' capacity to thrive. Her book, Black Towns, Black Futures, The Enduring Allure of a Black Place in the American West is a finalist for the 2020 Oklahoma Book Award. Initially founded in an effort to convince the U.S. to create an all-Black state, only a few towns cling heroically to life. Struggle and hope gives voice to the stories of the last remaining residents while charting their fight to ensure that their towns retain independence, character, and hope for a better future. 
Tulsa City County Library has encouraged everyone to watch the film Struggle and Hope. And now Shirley Nero and Jimmy White will provide the answers to six previously posed questions. This will be followed by a book talk with Dr. Carla Slocum. Shirley and Jimmy, take it away. Question number one. By 1905, Blacks in Oklahoma owned how many acres of land in Oklahoma? The answer is 1.5 million acres. Question number two. Shirley and Donnie Nero had the idea to develop a museum to honor Oklahoma's African American educators. In what black town is the Oklahoma African American Educators Hall of Fame located? The answer is Clearview, Oklahoma. Question number three. In what year did the Tulsa race riot or massacre occur? The answer is 1921. Question number four. Established in 1850, named the oldest historically all black town left in Oklahoma. The answer is Tallahassee. Question number five. The town of Tallahassee's zip code was changed to a zip code 74454 from what? Answer, 74466. Question number six. In what year was the town of Clearview established? Answer, 1903. Shirley, Jimmy, and Carla, you have all played a major role in the making of the film. So what are some of the interesting points that you can share about your own Oklahoma historic all black town experiences related to the documentary Struggle and Hope? One thing I think about is the fact that of course to make a documentary you have to do research and my major experience in black towns for me personally was uh, the research that I did over a number of years. And so I had sort of the researcher's eye as I'm looking at that film and just thinking about the different sorts of things that were incorporated in it. And I think about of the fact that the film gives us a picture of the real significance of the history, which of course we all know is so important, um, but you see how it resonates with what's going on today and how people connect with that history. So I think that's one of the things that really stands out for me. And of course, that connection with the history is what led me to want to do the research that I did because of my family history. So I think it's just sort of that connection between the, the history and how people are living today. Okay, some of the things that are interesting as it relates to the town of Clearview is that we are a, a community that's connected. We have people that have gone out and moved away and come back and that we are, we also realize that our town is not going to be like what it was in the past, but we look toward the future. And we are fortunate in our town that in Clearview is that we have saved some of the buildings that we have here in our town. And we have, we are fortunate enough that we have one of the buildings that was once part of the Rosenwald group uh, we have a WPA gym that we have uh, uh, restored because of the REIT grants and the TSEC uh, grants that we have and private donations that we have restored. That building, which is something that we are, can use as functionally as one of the buildings that the community use for funerals or family reunions and large group outings. And we also fortunate enough to have a smaller community center and we also have an Oklahoma African American Educators Hall of Fame that serves as a gathering place for some of the people in the town and for outsiders to come. So we are very fortunate that we are connected in the town, that we have people that are coming back. We have tourist groups that come here looking for a place to uh, actually go back in time, even though we don't have the buildings that are present, we do have historians that are available to tell them what our town is was and what it, it will be in the future. We
we can't go back to where we were in the future, in the past, excuse me, but in the past, but we can also look forward to rebuilding. And we do have people that are wanting to come back here and live. We do have um, a problem with, as other towns do have, but it's just like any other town that we're disappearing, some of our population is, but we, we do have that opportunity to rebuild on some aspects. We have a, a black rodeo that's been going on since about 1980. We have a Founders Day and we visit uh, each other through our gatherings. So we're not dying, but we're not going away either. I come from the unique town of Langston. And the reason I say it's unique in historically black towns is because of Langston University. Uh, during my lifetime, uh, I've seen the struggles and the hopes. As uh, many of you know, Langston was established by E.P. McCabe, and his hope was to make a haven for black people to escape the oppression of bigotry and uh, in the South. And so <clears throat> Lanks University is the reason that uh, uh, my father uh, came to Langston. He, uh, he was an agricultural teacher there. And uh, in Langston, we had two worlds. We had the city of Langston and then Langs University. And uh, we lived in the city, but I was a part of Langston University. And and I saw the unique uh, uh, struggles as the town had to deal with uh, 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 decaying water system, sewer system, streets, trying to raise the revenue to keep the town going. And then the state of Oklahoma underfunding Langston University, uh, the city of Langston and Langston University uh, was, a, it was a struggle for people to live there. It was the major, Langston was the, Blanks University was the major employer, and uh, people did uh, struggle, but they had the hope, the hope of a better day. And uh, if you uh, visit Langston now, you'll see that the streets are paved, the uh, streets are well lit. We have several businesses. Uh, uh, Langston is not a dying black town. It is uh, progressing into the future. Carla. We offer our congratulations on a job well done. Your book, Black Towns, Black Futures, The Enduring Allure of a Black Place in the American West is a finalist for the Oklahoma 2020 Book Award. Please share with your, us your experience in writing and researching as an anthropologist and author. So again, I'm Carla Slocum. I'm a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm glad to be here to talk about my research on black towns. So this here is a photo of me in Boley, Oklahoma, standing behind the headstone of my great uncle, Letchen Hill. He died in the 1940s, decades before I was born. My family called him by his nickname, Buddy, I first learned some of his life story from my mother who called him Uncle Buddy. And one memorable story that she tells about him uh, goes something like this. She said that he was living in an Alabama town as a, and working as a barber in the early 1900s. And one day a white barber came into town and declared that he was the, gonna be the barber of the town and he ran my uncle out of business. So my Uncle Buddy was really furious and he headed to Oklahoma because he had heard that Black Americans were developing rural communities, Black towns, where Black people were thriving and living relatively free from racism. He probably saw some type of recruitment ad like you see right now, which were heavy, very active, trying to recruit people, especially Blacks in the South, to come up to Oklahoma, what we now know as Oklahoma. So he moved to Boley, Oklahoma, where he had a successful life, becoming economically self-sufficient, improving his social status by settling in a community of Black people committed to 
uplifting themselves. And so here we have obviously the sign of Boley, Oklahoma, and a really common picture that actually you saw in the film of the Boley Town Council members in the early night in the early 20th century. And um, I think this this picture actually is a very good example of the sense of accomplishment and achievement and success that we attach to these black towns at this time. I first went to Oklahoma 16 years ago to research black towns. As I said, I'm an anthropologist and I study rural black communities for my profession. But I was drawn also to study Oklahoma's black towns because I had the family connection for me. That family history meant something to me in the present day. What I wanna tell you today is that black towns have a remarkable past that few of us know about. Now we know more because of the film. Um, and we all agree that we should know more about this history, that it really is something that's been hidden and it's an important history about black contributions to, the, to America that we need to know more about. But the town story continues to, um, but what I wanna tell you today is that black towns have this remarkable past, but they also generate interest today in them. And I'm gonna take you on a brief virtual tour, if you will, of black towns. And as I do that, I want you to remember that black towns aren't just an interesting story about what the communities were, they're also interesting stories about what they are today and even what they strive to be. So in many ways, what I'm gonna talk about helps reinforce, I think, some of the things that we see in the film. So by this point, you already know, if you've seen the film, you already know that black towns are not what they were 100 years ago. We've already talked about the fact that they're not stuck in the past. It's true that the town's population size is smaller, their business base, the number of businesses is much smaller, their economic strength isn't what it used to be. Um, and that's true actually of a lot of rural America. But I'd like to stress that even as small places that are financially fragile, that have few businesses and that experience limitations in their infrastructure, the Blacktown story and experience continues to attract people and lead different types of people to want to invest their energies in Black towns and connect with the communities. I'm gonna highlight here today three ways that this is actually apparent. First way is the ways that people engage their memories of the past for a present purpose, a purpose for today. The second way is the ways that people imagine and plan for a different economic future that they're currently, than they're currently living. And the third is the ways that people participate in what I refer to as a community of blackness. And just as a refresher here is this town, this, this map of Oklahoma um, within highlighted in red, the black towns that are re remaining today. The black town history evokes a powerful story of black excellence that resonates with many people. For a lot of older residents in black towns, their memories of what the towns once achieved are what they continue to highlight. There is well known pride in black town history of entrepreneurship and the incredible extent of businesses that the communities held, but schools are another source of important memories that people hold on to. This is an abandoned old school building. And if you were to do a physical tour of black towns, you'd see a site like this in most of the communities. When you see this building, you might actually think it's an eyesore. And it's true that the building is in disrepair. But what's also true is that it holds something more than its physical appearance to people who live there. Historically, schools were one way that black towns supported themselves. They educated their own children and by all accounts, the education was rigorous. I met lots of elders who talked of how strong their black town education was. Integration led to many black towns losing their schools and having to consolidate with neighboring white towns. So today people revere that period before they lost their schools and the presence of the buildings, however dilapidated, serve as a way to reinforce that memory of an example of Blacktown success. The memories of the schools keep people coming back for reunions, to reconnect with their childhood friends, or maybe to remember their success in athletics, which is something we also saw in the film. Engaging with that physical school building by holding meetings, in the, in the actual building today or having certain kinds of activities that happen in or around the buildings. That's also a way of keeping that school history alive. 
The town of Lima, Oklahoma is in the central part of the state, about an hour east of Oklahoma City, and Lima had a Rosenwald school. It's not the only black town that had a Rosenwald school, but it's one of them. And it's also one of the thousands of schools across the country that was funded by the philanthropist Julius, Julian Rosenwald, who created funds to support schools that would educate black youth during the Jim Crow era. In the mid 20th century, Lima consolidated with another town that became named New Lima, and black youth in Lima went to this integrated school. The consolidation is actually a sore point for some people today, but the presence of their non-functioning and boarded up Rosenwald School provides a bit of comfort or, or salve. The town leadership has held fundraisers to support the school, and they have had plans to repurpose the building so that it can be used for community activities. There have been efforts to invest in the school as a way to boost the town. So Lima is an example of how the school history and positive memories of school life, and that's reinforced by the presence of the old school building, actually shapes the present engagement with black towns and are a catalyst and a motivator for people to want to invest in black towns. And by invest, I don't just mean financially invest, but that there is that also, but also just invest themselves in committing to the communities and supporting the communities. So we've actually been talking a lot about the futures of black towns. And this is important to think about with regard to the economic futures. What are those economic future possibilities for black towns? This is Pecan Street in Boley. And just like the schools in disrepair, black town main streets, black, black town main streets are no longer the active economic districts that they used to be. These two pictures here side by side are of downtown Boley, one on the left from the 1970s, the one on the right, I took that, and it's from uh, the early 2000s. And you can even see, I think, a difference in these two pictures in terms of the number of cars on the street and actually in the street, the one on the left, the black and white photo, you can also see that there's some building signs that are up that are no longer up today, leading us to think those, those businesses might still have been active. But Pecan Street today is quieter, less active strip on most days, not all. And like Boley, uh, many towns today have just a couple of brick and mortar businesses in their downtown, while some towns actually have no businesses at all. But you shouldn't let this image fool you. While you might assume that black towns are ghost towns, I've often heard that term applied to black towns, and I, I think it's not an appropriate term. Um, you might assume that black towns are ghost towns, particularly when it comes to their act economic activity, but there's a lot that actually happens in the community economies. Just like people in the film who, who you saw are actively working to solve the water crisis, there are people living in black towns who are often working on plans to activate their economies. They're trying to start businesses, they're devising plans to energize businesses, there are a number of organizations working on this type of thing. And actually the number of organizations are actually striking when you think about how small the town is. So for the town size, there are actually a number of organizations and groups that are working on these kinds of efforts. The efforts though meet some challenges. For example, there are people who start small convenience marts or stores like this dollar store in Langston. Um, and they work really hard to get them going uh, I observed that women actually play a, a large role in this, at least at the time that I was doing my research. And women are actually a force behind a lot of the businesses that are starting up in black towns. But often they can't get enough revenue from the business to stay open and stay out of debt. They struggle to keep the business alive, usually because residents in the black towns have cheap options like a Walmart or an Amazon where they can turn for their consumer purchases. There are also very few employment options in black towns because the economies are not very robust. So people have to work outside of town or for many people, they migrate away during their working age. The employment situation, the fragile economic status of black towns were also a justification for prison building in two towns, Taft and Bowling. In the 1980s, the state of Oklahoma placed prisons in both of these communities with a promise of employment for local residents. But most black towners that I talked to during my research said that 
that promise didn't actually play out. It didn't happen. We talked to over, in my, in my research, we talked to many people in both of these communities as well as other communities. And I met very few people who actually worked in one of the prisons. There is of course the irony of state prisons that are known for disproportionate incarceration of black Americans. So there's an irony of a prison being built in black communities. The additional irony though, is that some of the buildings housing prisons in a black town were once places for services that met the needs of black Oklahomans. And that idea of having an institution in a black town that's there to fit the purpose of the black town residents is very much in keeping with the idea or the ethos of a black town, these, having these resources that support the population. I talked with a woman named Ethel, that's a pseudonym that I've given her to protect her identity, and she would now be in her 80s. She remembered when a facility known as the Industrial Institute for the Deaf, Blind, and Orphans of the Colored Race was active in Taft when she was a child. The DBNO, as it was called, and it's still called today, was a residential facility that served Black youth across the state who had special needs. And the youth and Ethel and others said the DBNO kids, that's the phrase that they usually use to refer to them, um, she said that the DBNO kids were integrated fully into Taft town life. They went to Taft schools, they played with Taft children, Taft schools even accommodated the DBNO children such that all Taft children at the time had to learn sign language to be able to be conversant with their DBNO peers. Ethel, therefore, had fond memories engaging with children at the DBNO, and the quality of those interactions was emblematic of the ways that the town approached its institutions as if they were there to serve the population. So for her, it was inconceivable that the DBNO would turn into a prison that was separate from community life and also restricted people from connecting rather than welcoming them into the community. The prison's employment model that doesn't incorporate many Taft citizens who lived there is at odds with the historic rich interactions that Ethel knew and appreciated about Taft. Her reaction is perhaps a reminder that the ways people imagine economic futures for black towns today, they struggle to reconcile the principles on which the towns were founded with the present economic structures and realities of the country and the state. It's also a reminder that a black town economic model might not be purely about economics, but also about the meaning of the place and the people to that place. In the film, you learned about big, about large black town events like Rentiesville's Blues Festival and the different black town rodeos. Bowley, Oklahoma has the largest black town rodeo event in Oklahoma. The Bowley, it's called the Bowley Rodeo and Barbecue, and it began over 100 years ago, and it's a prime example of how people are drawn to 21st century Black towns. It's estimated that 20,000 people convene for the event every year. And in this case, people come not merely to watch and participate in rodeo activities, but also to socialize and commune, to eat, to see and be seen, to party and to celebrate. It's really a very festive event. For my research, I attended a number of Blacktown rodeos, including Bowley's a few times, and based on the apparent racial demographics of the crowd, as well as the kinds of social activity that takes place at the event, I consider that the way people who tend to participate, uh, I consider that the people who tend to participate and the way they participate underscores how much people want to be part of a community event and a Black community event. At the same time, I also look at the Rodeo Weekend as boldly presenting itself to the world. And what is that self-presentation? It's that Bowley is a, a Black community that's diverse, that's inclusive, that's modern. So diverse and inclusive because it incorporates a wide variety of Black people and others. Modern because a lot of the rodeo activities in that weekend include showing the ways of the town's people and the audience they attract are sporting the latest styles. And by styles, I don't simply mean fashion, although it includes that, but also just popular culture and the kinds of things that people connect with, things that we associate with a very modern life. 
So being modern, inclusive, and diverse, along with fun, I think is a meaningful part of the rodeo's attraction because it presents a Black community and Black people as worthy, and it also normalizes a Black town in ways that Black communities are not typically regarded. The rodeo is the biggest activity that the town relies on for revenue, but its significance is more than economics. The two-day festival includes a street parade on Saturday afternoon, and in the evenings, there are rodeos both Saturday and Sunday. During the rodeo weekend, crowds hear from the opening speaker about the history of Boley and how Black people came together to form a vibrant community. The speaker's message is also about the town's virtues. Boley is quiet and peaceful, and the speaker actually invites people to come and live in Boley. So in many ways, it's a way of showcasing Boley and encouraging people to want to connect with Boley, including moving there. I consider the parade the major kickoff and where a majority of Black identified social groups are on display. Most people who are in the parade represent Black organizations like is pictured here. We have a fraternal organization, we have dancing step clubs, we have also that are in the parade, you have a, a Miss Black Oklahoma, you have uh, black Greek organizations, black school groups and bands, a variety of groups that are all in the parade. And in many ways, you could think of this like any town parade and festival. But there's diversity among these groups of, of people, especially the black groups that are presented. And I was struck by the unmistakable presence of low riders in the parade, participants who fit a young urban black male demographic. So the low riders are those who are in the metallic colored, bright design cars with the shiny rims. They play hip hop music loudly as they go down the street during the uh, during the parade, and they're really unmistakable, and they're also a large, at the time I was doing my research, they were a large representation of the paraders. Um, and they're not, they come from large numbers from Tulsa and Oklahoma, and they are not the typical group you might expect to see in a rural setting, especially alongside groups like the Boley League, the Little Leaguers, and the local Greek organizations who are also parading, yet have a different image to us. They are also pictured here, the low riders on the left are pictured here alongside the older black male car clubs that also parade in Boley's Rodeo. So the parade encompasses groups, almost entirely black groups, and who we might not think would normally socialize together and be in this space together. And to me, it comes across as a very open space, therefore, and a place for Black people, almost like what Ethel was saying about how Taft historically welcomed Black youth with special needs. So it's an inclusive place, a uh, community, a community that's known for its Black identity, and it encompasses a wide, wide variety of people. This is the image from my book cover that was also at the beginning of my presentation here. It's what I began with. And I chose this image for the reasons I'm telling you now. It profiles a black person on a horseback during the rodeo parade. This is during the Bully Rodeo. He's on horseback, which of course speaks to the history of black town rodeos. And that horseback rider is next to spectators who are in these brilliant bright colors in contemporary dress next to motorcycles with a building in disrepair as the backdrop. And this to me is the black town of today, a place of diverse black community members or black, a diverse black community that's steep in a very valued and highly revered and important history that struggles with some of its present material conditions. And by that, I mean the economic conditions, the infrastructural conditions, and yet it still draws people to it. It draws back people who once lived there and migrated away. It also draws in new people who are intrigued by what these communities represent. And so just like my uncle who was drawn to Boley 100 years ago, and just like me who was drawn to come and look at Black towns and engage with Black towns 15 years ago, um, this image to me represents that, that idea of an alluring Black place. 
I'd like to thank Alicia Latimer and the African American Resource Center at Redisill Library and also the Tulsa City County Library System. Thanks. Uh, the Black towns are really significant to Oklahoma's history and each of you has played a, a major role in uh, uh, the focus that really is owed and due to these towns currently and in the past. Carla, your book was, I personally read your book, I found it most informative, the perspectives that you gave about uh, the the feelings of and emotions of the people in the towns. So I encourage each of you open at this point to simply say what the towns mean to you or to provide any significant uh, insights about the uh, historical events or the, uh, the issues uh, that should be uh, talked about as we invite people to tour the Black towns. The Black towns mean a lot to me, obviously. Um, you know, my perspective is a little bit different, of course, as I didn't grow up in a Black town. I was an adult when I first walked into a Black town. I even learned the stories, my family stories about Black towns late in life, relatively late in life. I was in my 20s. Um, but at the same time, they're important to me because the more I learned about them, they became a way for me to connect with my grandfather, with my mother's experience. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I mean, one thing that I found from the research I was doing was that these stories that people learn over and over from different generations of their family members are important ways that they continue to connect with the communities. And so I think that's one part of my experience that is different, but also related to what people experience there. Um, yeah, and so I, I think that's that's really my, my big point is just that uh, the, the connection that you get from the the history, the family history that you might have can, can be significant and a lot of people have that. Um, I think I also wanna stress that I made a lot of friends as a result of the research that I did. And I'll be honest, one of the most rewarding things for me about writing this book was when I came back to Oklahoma and just was so embraced by people in the towns because they felt like there's something written about us that is out there. And I didn't really expect that. I'm, and I, um, you know, you're, you're nervous when you write something, you don't know if people are gonna like it. But beyond that, I just was really moved and, and appreciative of the response. And it just was a way of sort of speaking to the kinds of connections that I also have with the folks that I, um, that I got to know through my research. Well, this is Shirley in Nero. I grew up as Shirley Ann Ballard in Clearview, Oklahoma. And I attended college at East Central University, was East Central State. And my major was home economics. But when I uh, began began my career, there was not a place for me to teach uh, Oklahoma, um, home economics. So I had a minor in sociology and psychology, which enabled me to become a social studies teacher. I ended up getting a master's degree in history. So there was my journey. I started teaching history. And realizing that there wasn't as much of Oklahoma history dealing with African Americans in the state, I, that was my goal, was to teach about African Americans in Oklahoma and teaching about the black town since I grew up in a black town. So that was how I got invested into oh, black towns. Growing up here, I realized that I needed to teach more about what was going on in the black towns. I am now on the Oklahoma Historical Society board. I am chair of the Black Heritage Committee. And luckily I found Alicia Latimer in Tulsa. Either she found me, something happened there that now I am a tour guide for her group each summer. And I truly enjoy doing that because 
together with her and with Jimmy that we have gone all over the state and as a goal of the Black Heritage Committee that I can just about do what I want to do and our goal is to go out through all of the Black towns and the Black communities, not just the Black towns, and find out what's available and discover all these other communities around the state. So my goal is, is to collect and to preserve and to share with everyone in the state. I do not write books, but I do write little articles. I'm not a publisher, Jimmy does that. So he can publish whatever we learn because he's on the, on the tour. I'm just the one that's the go between, between Alicia and Jimmy. But as far as the impact that we have on the state is that whatever we collect and whatever we try to preserve is to share that with the Oklahoma Historical Society and have people put those items of whatever they have with the History Center and that way it is preserved for life, for our lives and for the future of the other lives of people. It doesn't go away with the Oklahoma Historical Society and get people to realize what they have is valuable. It's a history that will never be destroyed and that's what my goal is in life. Now as far as the town of Clearview, we have a goal to preserve what we have in our own town and that is through the community centers that we have. And if you come down to our town, and this is to get people to come here, is that we have two community centers. And if you walk in one and you walk in the other, you're gonna find pictures all over the wall that depicts our history. And we also have a collection of all the other 13 original black towns that are up there. And that draws an interest to them to ask us questions. And if they can ask us questions, we can go on and on and on and tell you about all the other black towns in the state of Oklahoma or the communities. So my goal is to have every other town to do the same thing. Put something up, up there on your walls in your community centers that will draw an interest for your visitors to ask questions. Another thing is, is that if you are a writer or you're attempting to be a writer, go to your local newspaper and ask them that you put in an article every week, which is what I do with our local newspapers. I'm writing about history every week in our local newspaper that goes out to all the states in the state. Somebody in California or something like that or New York is always calling back and asking, I'm, I'm loving your articles and they don't even know who I am. One interesting thing about I went into a flower shop and somebody says, are you Shirley Nero? Yes, I am. Well, who are you? Well, they read my articles from somewhere else. So that's a good thing. And how do we make an impact on our state or the United States is to put the word out in a book or newspaper or a magazine. Another thing is through the Oklahoma African American Educators Hall of Fame. We do the same thing. We have people that want to have someone inducted. We do 10 every year. We have a website. O-A-A-E-H-O-F dot org that where we can we do 10 people a year and that's uh, educators who are heroes in our black towns and our black schools are our educators and that's the way we are preserving that history which hasn't been done anywhere else I don't think they do that in any other state we have a couple of states that are trying to mimic what we're doing so we're very proud of anything of that also and another one thing, and then I'll be quiet and let somebody else talk, is that we have a mural that we've gotten a grant. Grants are the one thing that's a savior for our towns. If you can get a grant to do something in your town, is that we're probably going to be the first time I haven't seen a grant in any, I mean a mural in any other town. So we're going to have a mural on one side of our wall that a young man by the name of Muse out of Oklahoma City is going to come down and put this huge mural depicting the black towns in Oklahoma, and that's gonna be done this summer. So if you wanna to come to Clearview, visit, call me, 918-698-6037, and come make, take a visit, uh, get a tour of the black, black towns where available. I uh, grew up in the most unique all black town in Oklahoma. Langston. And the reason I say it's the most unique is because it was founded by a man who could not be stopped. And that was E.P. McCabe. He wanted to be the first black governor 
elected governor in the United States. And so when the 18 uh, uh, 100s, the uh, Oklahoma Territory was opened up for uh, settlement, 1889, uh, April 22nd, he urged black people to make that land run. And he hoped that if 10,000 black folks came, that there would be so many black people in the new territory that they would have to create uh, a new black state. Freedmen would, uh, would then be in charge and elect him governor. Well, this showed me that uh, even though you have these high aspirations, uh, that there are people who are going to crush your dreams. And so uh, uh, the fear of a black state being created out of Oklahoma Territory led to uh, some very detrimental uh, aspects. But uh, Langston is unique because the black people who did make the run, there weren't 10,000, so uh, he was not able to get the black state established, but he did establish a black town. And one of the first actions of the black people was to create a institution of higher learning, Langston University. And this made a very unique situation for a young man such as myself to grow up in. In Langston, we had Melvin Tolson, the poet laureate of Liberia, and we had Ozzie Lewis, the town drunk. And so I noticed at an early age that we had the very highest of society and what was considered the very lowest. However, I noticed that in the eyes of the majority of the people in Langston, we were all just people because we did have an outside enemy that it didn't matter if you had a PhD from Harvard University or you were the town uh, crackhead that we were all looked upon as the same. And so uh, um, that led to the experience that uh, we were denied our high school and so it was taken away from us. And when I uh, uh, matriculated at uh, Langston University Laboratory School and was ready to go to high school, I had to go to the predominantly white town of Guthrie. And when I went to Guthrie, I noticed a, a feeling that I didn't have in Langston. As I said, uh, I've mingled with PhDs and I, I mingled with the uh, with the people who who uh, shot craps at Mellow Babies, uh, my uncle's uh, uh, juke joint, and we all just looked at each other as being people. But when I got to Guthrie, I noticed that I wasn't just a person who had the ability to becoming the president of the United States or being broke and living in the streets. I was looked upon because of my skin color as being unfit, not worthy. And so uh, the black towns provided that assurance and that protection and that, that drive to be something. And so today that same is true that, that the black towns uh, are still providing something that black people can't really get anywhere else. And, and, uh, and for uh, people who grew up in black towns, uh, that's, that it's, it's a, I, I couldn't wait to get out of Langston when I was 18. I just wanted, when I graduated from high school, I just wanted to get away from that rural country town and go to the big city. And uh, now I'm nearly 70 years old. And when I return to Langston, it's just a peace. It's, it's, I know that I'm safe. And, and the only thing I can hear is in the distance, a dog barking. And, and for a young man, I know that's not, that's not what they want. They want to hear the roar of the, 
of the engines and the jet planes flying above, but but there are, are black people who who need that peace and, and tranquility and and they need to know that they are able to walk their own streets in peace. And and this is something that uh, that black towns are still doing today. Very good. I I um, have been on those tours for 14 years with the Tulsa City County Library and uh, Shirley and Jimmy and uh, Carla. You've all each played some role in that. One thing that strikes me about the town is the humor, uh, the humorous stories that they tell. One humorous story was about Pretty Boy Floyd when he, uh, his gang <laughs> decided that they would um, rob the bank in, was it Taft? Bowley. In Bowley, I, ap I apologize. Bowley. When Pretty Boy Floyd uh, decided to rob the bank on the day when they were having a big event and a lot of the people in the town had shotguns. Uh, tell, can somebody just briefly tell us one of those stories? That's what's fun about the tour is you hear the local people tell these amazing historic tales, but please tell me about us about uh, Bowley and the notorious gang that rode into town. You want to do it, Shirley, or me? All right. Go ahead, Brittany, if you want to. Well, it was... We can uh, tell, tell it together. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Floyd, uh, his gang, uh, Pretty Boy Floyd, as he was known, uh, uh, he was not in, directly involved in this incident. It was some of his gang members. And so they ride into um, Bowley to rob the bank. But they had been warned that those black folks worked hard for that money and it wasn't going to be as easy as they thought to get it. And the other thing that they, they did that was a mistake was that they decided to rob the bank at the height of dove hunting season when everybody was pair, carrying their, their hunting rifles. And so uh, they attempt to rob the bank. The farmers and merchants who had their money in the bank rushed there and, uh, and the gang is shot up. And so they were brought to swift justice, uh, Oklahoma justice. Very good. I, yes. I also one, uh, one of the uh, uh -huh. go ahead. Yeah, Shirley. I uh, just wanted to know that one of the, one of the one of the gang members would happen to be African American that was killed that was in mm -hmm. the getaway car of the of the gang, and he was also killed. And one of the ones that was shot inside the bank, he survived, but he was also shot. But he lived to to die at an old age doing the robbery. But Pretty Boy Floyd had also warned them not to go in and mess with those Negroes down there, that you would probably get killed. Well, that was some poor planning on their part. But it also, is, uh, there's exciting things that, that uh, happened in the towns. And uh, Carlo, in your book, uh, I enjoyed very much the way that you told the stories of uh, related to gentrification in the towns, uh, the way that the uh, land in the town is, uh, I don't know what the word is for the, if it's taken over or lost or can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with the land development in those towns? Um, so we heard this, the people that did the research with me, my research assistants, um, we heard this sort of story pop up a number of times that there were people who were financially strapped and were unable to meet the taxes on their property. And um, there were people who kind of watched that 
those tax records and see who's defaulting on their on their uh, their financial responsibilities for paying the taxes and they swoop in and purchase the land and then sell it back to people because they realize that the people in the black towns um, the land means something to them usually it's you know generational land it's land that's been in the family for a long time people don't want to part with it so they kind of prey on that um, on that and tell people they'll sell them back the land at a very high rate over time so you can make small payments. So we saw lots of people, a number of people who um, were in that sort of situation. And I guess that's part of the struggle. You know, we were talking before about struggle and hope. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the struggles that some people are encountering right now. Um, when you, when you talk about, I'd like to continue with that. When you talk about land, uh, you, and you've been talking about human stories, uh, a story that I was told about Langston is that uh, uh, during the uh, 89er land rush, uh, most people came to uh, Oklahoma Territory because they were farmers. And the main uh, asset is to have uh, uh, fertile land, the best land. Well, in the Langston area, Logan County, uh, some of the best land was along the Cimarron River. And so that's what they call bottom land. And uh, uh, because uh, the white folks ran in and grabbed up all the good land, they forced the black people to uh, move into the old hilly area that wasn't as fertile, uh, which is now Langston. And some people refer to Langston University as being Sugar Hill. As you approach uh, Langston, you'll notice that it stands out above all the horizon. You'll see Langston University uh, from miles away. It's on a hill. The funny part about this is that uh, they didn't realize that every spring, the Cimarron River would uh, leave its banks. It would flood. And so the white folks would get flooded out and the black folks would dry and, and continue to prosperous up on Sugar Hill. How interesting. Uh, that's a term that reminds me of uh, the band, the Sugar Hill Gang from back in the 70s. I uh, didn't have a point of reference regarding that. We want to close out our program. If uh, each of you would like to have any closing remarks uh, as we end, we do thank you for having participated in our commemoration of the Black towns in Oklahoma. So uh, I'll ask each of you to just take one moment and give a little uh, whatever comment you care to share with our audience about those black towns in Oklahoma? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, as the tourism is becoming a big part of our black town histories, is that each of one of our towns has something special about them, something of interest. As you say that what's the draw into Bowley is the, the uh, pretty boy Floyd story and the gang that comes into into the town that shoots them up. Everyone wants to go there to see the bank where that happened. In Clearview, we have the story of Alpha Charles Sams, who came here mm -hmm. to back the Africa movement. And you may have something over in Grayson that talks about uh, the sheriff or something that comes in. Uh, Bass Reeves may be coming as far as, as far west as from Arkansas, Bass Reeves story. So every town has their own special story that they can uh, tell when the tourist comes in. So that's something that the tourism can uh, uh, zoom in on and will bring tourism. So I think that's going to be a big thing for us uh, for the years to come, if we can get the tourism department to put us on the maps and bring people to our towns, is that we just have to figure out how can we make that happen for us and how can we generate money from tourism and get those signs on the highways and tell them where we are how can we be located 
And I think that's something that we can bring us business and bring us money into our town and bring uh, our ec economic basis up since we don't have any other ways of doing that. And thank you for, in, for having us as part of your book tour and our Juneteenth celebration of Black Town Tours. Thank you. Jimmy? Yes, I'd like to also uh, uh, offer my thanks to uh, you and the uh, Rudisil Library uh, for giving us an opportunity to talk to people from all over the uh, United States uh, about our Black towns. And, and, and that uh, I'm really appreciative of you not giving up even during these these uh, unusual times and uh, presenting the Black Town tour in a new and, and uh, unique uh, method as this. And, uh, and uh, I look forward to um, uh, continuing to uh, be able to tell the story of, of Black people and their, their efforts to contribute to uh, development of this state and nation. Thank you so much. And Carla, uh, finally, your uh, book really moved me and, and it's, it's a well-written, well-researched uh, look, in-depth look into the challenges faced by the uh, Black towns in Oklahoma. So Carla, tell us how we can get that book. We, we do carry it for the library, uh, but uh, Carla, please tell us how our viewers may purchase uh, your book. Well, thank you for carrying it in the library, and thanks for your nice words about the book. Um, the book is published by the University of North Carolina Press, so if you go to UNC Press uh, website, you'll be able to find the book there. Um, I also want to offer my thanks. I'm really glad to be part of this. You know, the first time I went to Oklahoma just to even explore whether I would do some research, I was there just for a few days, and one of the things I did was took an individual tour. It was myself with two other people who were also from out of state. I didn't know them, but we were convened together with somebody who was doing individual tours. Um, so this is how, this is my entree into learning about the learning about black towns was through a tour myself and in addition to the family history but of course once i was there um, it was through a tour and i know these are so important for people to this is an important way for people to be able to learn about black towns and um, so i'm really glad to be part of this i'm honored that i was included and i just want to thank you you are all very welcome we are very pleased to uh, support literacy about Oklahoma's Black history, and certainly the Black towns have had a significant role in our history that has been too often overlooked. So each of you is making your mark on history through programs such as these, and we do thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we want to end our program by congratulating all of our panelists on the job well done. Thank you all. Jimmy and Shirley, look forward to seeing you next year for the 24th annual historic All Black Town Tour on the second Saturday in June, 2021. We encourage our audience members to purchase Carla Slocum's book, Black Towns, Black Futures, and to also visit the Oklahoma African American Educators Hall of Fame in Clearview, Oklahoma, as well as the Bowley Rodeo, the Rennesville Blues Festival, and the many other great activities connected with honoring the rich heritage of the historic Oklahoma all-Black towns. Enjoy your Juneteenth celebrations, everyone. We'll see you at the library or visit www.tulsalibrary.org. Take care. <laughs>